Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. You are listening to another installment of the NTC podcast. This is episode 79, uh, presented by Sports Business Classroom. Aaron Washington here. Glad to be back with you guys on another broadcast. This evening, we have the opportunity to welcome in once again. This is the second time on the pod. Glad to have him back. CP, the franchise. If you guys are Knicks fans, if you're Knicks enthusiasts, New York enthusiasts, you're going to love this guy right here. If you're not familiar with his work already, uh, he does some great breakdowns on New York, the Knicks situation. Um, so he's the creator of Knicks Fan TV and uh, Team NBA Report. Uh, he's a host over at uh, Sirius XM Radio. So if you guys are over on XM, you're definitely going to want to tune in for this guy. Uh, does some great stuff over there. I mean, he's been featured all over. Bleacher Report, ESPN, uh, WFan 660 on the radio. You can hear this guy break some stuff down. So, you know, CP, love that you're back on the pod, man. I mean, your content is awesome. Watch it all the time. Love what you do. And uh, just glad to have the opportunity to collaborate again this evening, uh, talking about a little bit of Knicks, a little bit of World Cup, stuff like that, man. So I really appreciate the time. Yeah, no problem, Aaron. Uh, happy to be on. You guys do great work. So anytime. Appreciate that. Uh, so let's jump right into it, man. We got some fun stuff going on here in the, in the land of the Knicks, New York. Uh, to kind of start things off before we get into uh, a few of the guys that are playing for New York right now across the world. Uh, wanted to kind of get a feel for how the Knicks community is feeling in the midst of that second round out at the hands of the Miami Heat uh, just a few months ago. Uh, by all accounts, a very successful season. Things went really well. Uh, Brunson played awesome. Randall was really solid. Um, you know, Josh Hart was a hand and glove fit for New York, bringing him over uh, from Portland. Uh, really awesome fit for that team. So, you know, how are things looking on your end? You know, how is everybody feeling going into next season? And uh, what are the, kind of the expectations as a whole uh, for the Knicks going into uh, the next campaign? Yeah, I think last year was was a, a great season by by any account for this Knicks team. Jalen Brunson being here was a revelation to many Knicks fans, not just for being a stabilizing force at the point guard position, but really establishing himself as an all-star caliber player for this team and showing up in so many big moments for this team. You know, the fact that they won 47 games uh, going past the Cavs in a gentleman sweep in a 4-5 matchup. And then, yeah, you know what? The, the Miami series was tough to watch. The Knicks were struggling offensively outside of Jalen Brunson. Jalen Brunson seemed to be the only player that could crack that heat defense. Uh, but, you know, they they weren't able to, to be successful successful against Miami. Julius Randle struggled with injury and his effectiveness. RJ Barrett, though, was able to turn up, but a lot of guys really didn't show up in that Heat series. Manuel quickly was quiet. Josh Hart came back to earth. Quentin Grimes wasn't really to, to able to give this team an offensive lift. And so it was a great season, but going into the offseason now, re-signing Josh Hart, signing Dante DiVincenzo, the guard rotation is going to be cluttered, but DiVincenzo adding another high IQ winning type of basketball player I think is is going to only elevate this team but there are some holes and there are some question marks where does this team go at the backup four spot they traded Obi Toppin to the Pacers Obi wanted some more playing time and so it was kind of a decision that was best for both parties but that leaves a hole there mm -hmm. they're now a little bit less athletic with the departure of Obi Toppin uh, how will they handle injuries and durability with they you know you have Jalen Brunson you have Josh Hart you have R.J. Barrett playing over in the Philippines for the FIBA World Cup. Will that have any ramifications as they head into the season? I think those are some of the question marks I look at. But by and large, this Knicks team running it back with a little upgrade there in, in Dante DiVincenzo is right where they need to be. Yeah, those are my feelings exactly. Uh, I mean, of course, you want the team to go all the way. That's the, the primary goal for any franchise. But considering the struggles that New York has had, uh, in the past, you know, before Brunson came on board, uh, before Tibbs came on board, um, a lot of success, a lot of wins. Like you said, that first round series, I think, was a little bit of a surprise to some, you know, considering the fact that that Cavs team, was, they were no slouch. Uh, they yeah. had a lot of firepower with Donovan Mitchell and the Twin Towers and everything. So really fantastic season. Like you said, those upgrades are key. The departure of Toppin, you know, we're going to see how that affects them. It might be a little bit yeah. thin up front, but – Overall, looks like a really solid team. I think they're going to be right there in the mix again where they were last season as far as positioning, jostling in the East. And we're going to get into that a little bit here later as far as breaking down the Atlantic division because I think that's one of the most competitive divisions in the NBA from top to bottom. Not a single bad team in the mix. They're all really solid. So 
I'm looking forward to that part of our conversation here, man. But before we get into that, uh, you mentioned this a little bit. Uh, the World Cup is currently underway. Uh, as of this recording, we are in day one of the FIBA World Cup for 2023. And there are a few Knicks players uh, participating in this tournament that uh, I like to highlight here and just kind of get your feel as far as their participation in the Cup specifically, and then also kind of look forward to next season and what you're expecting from them. So to kind of kick things off here, this is a player we asked you about at Summer League 2022 last year. At the time, this was a new signing. You know, he was a $100 million guy. There were a lot of questions about him coming over from Dallas Mavericks where he was more of a secondary guy. And then they paid him like a primary player. And there was some skepticism there, but he proved everybody wrong. And now that contract looks like a bargain. Uh, you know, you go to the our, our cap sheets on uh, no trade clause and you can see the percentages of the cap and you see him in the 20s and then you go look at other players that got these extensions and they're at 30, 35 percent making crazy money. And now it seems like a really great deal that New York signed to bring on Jalen Brunson and his success from the Knicks the, um, that the experience last season we just talked about, I think will really carry over here to the World Cup for Team USA. And I, I kind of identified a few reasons as to why they brought on Brunson on board, why he was one of, I think, they're one of the guys they keyed in on bringing in for this team. You look at his leadership ability, a guy that you can look to and count on in big moments. He doesn't shy away from the big moments. Even though he's undersized, he plays a lot bigger than he is. You wouldn't think that he's a 5'10", 5'11", 6-foot guy the way he plays. He rumbles in the paint. He's comfortable amongst the trees. He has a really great short mid-range game. He's a really smart player, really just loves to kind of get down and dirty and makes a lot of really great plays. And all of those traits are exactly what Team USA was looking for. He's played with Luka uh, for a few seasons, so he's no stranger to playing alongside other great players. He's not going to be selfish. He's not going to be looking for his own shot every time down. He's just one of those guys you can always count on. So those are some of the first impressions I got as far as Brunson's possible contributions to Team USA. But turning over to you, CP, I mean, you've watched him the entire entirety of last season. Uh, he has a few games with Team USA under his belt. How do you feel about what he's contributed so far to Team USA? And what are you looking forward to seeing from him as the games become official now that we're in the um, in the official rounds of, of the World Cup and um, Team USA starts to face some stiffer competition? Yeah, it, it feels great to see him out there on that stage representing Team USA, especially last year after he had an all-star caliber season and an all-NBA caliber season, but was shunned uh, on both of those accolades. I think this is a well-deserved honor for Jalen Brunson to lead Team USA. Head coach Steve Kerr has spoke gl spoken glowingly about uh, Jalen Brunson since camp broke back in Las Vegas earlier in, in August and, and just spoke about him as being the natural leader and the guy on Team USA who they're really going to look to for his leadership. As you mentioned, his physical style of play is something that Steve Kerr really values when you play in this FIBA system because in FIBA, as we've learned and as we see in these games, it is a more physical type of game. You're able to use your chest a little bit more. The referees let a lot go. And so that's why I believe Team USA really wanted a guy like a Brunson as opposed to a guy like a Trey Young who's been making his rounds complaining that he should have been on the team. But when you look at this Team USA roster, it's a young roster. They don't have chemistry, which is a disadvantage when you look at some of the other teams in this tournament, like a France, mm -hmm. a Spain, Lithuania. A lot of right. these teams, they have guys who are playing together, whether in their respective local leagues or in international play every four years, every three years, whenever those tournaments are. So with USA not having that chemistry, it's very important to have a Brunson who's a steady force, a stabilizing force, doesn't get too high, doesn't get too low, and doesn't fold under pressure. Very important to have them have him at the head of the table. And so that's why I think he, he's going to be very valuable for Team USA. And I think this stint here in the World Cup is only going to serve him well in terms of elevating his profile at the NBA level, once he stepped out of Luka Doncic's shadow, came to the biggest city, the brightest lights, and shined brightly for the Knicks, I think this is just another step for him on this resume. So it's, it's, he's in a great spot. 100%. Everywhere he's gone, he's a, he's he's won. You, you look at what he contributed when he was in college for Villanova, ton of success there, goes to Dallas, uh, not a highly regarded player, not a super hyped player, but he just does the dirty work. Uh, he's consistent got wins for the Mavs. They went to Western Conference Finals not too long ago. 
Then he goes to New York and the same thing, winning culture to a team that, I mean, let's be honest, you know, since the days of Mello, there hasn't been a ton of success there. So he goes in and kind of sets a great example as far as just winning and just working hard every day. So all great points and hundred percent agree. And I love the addition of him on this team as a steadying presence, like you said. Uh, do want to bring up a, one issue though, when it comes to Brunson, that is kind of hard to overlook. And we talked about how he plays. He plays a lot bigger than he is, but at the end of the day, he's still a smaller player. He's going to be the, one of the smallest guys on the court every single time out. And we did see that in their final exhibition game, uh, you know, playing against Germany, one of the best teams in the world outside of USA presented a little bit of a challenge. And in that game, we saw Tyrese Halliburton get a little bit more run than Brunson. And I think one of the reasons why was because of the size. Uh, it can definitely work against Brunson sometimes. He works hard. we got to give him credit for that. But it's it's hard to overcome a size deficit when you're playing against guys that are, you know, tough and strong from these other countries. So it did look like it worked against him a little bit, and he lost a little bit of PT for that reason. Uh, just want to ask you about his minutes load. Um, I think depending on the team, it could sway a little bit. If you're playing against a team that's not super physical with a ton of size, you know, he can fit right in. Uh, however, if we're playing against a team that's a little bit more intense uh, and as far as the backcourt goes, and they have a little bit more size to offer, could uh, present some challenges to Brunson. So how do you see his minutes and his contributions kind of coming and going and changing alongside some of those guards like Reeves, uh, Anthony Edwards, and Tyler Celebert? Yeah, and as you pointed out in the Germany game, it, I, I think it was size, but it, it was also lateral foot speed because he had some trouble yeah. – keep him up with, with Dennis Schroeder and, and had some trouble in terms of his pick and roll coverages. And so mm -hmm. his defense is, is not going to be his strongest suit. He can, he competes. He certainly competes. He was, he was near the top of the NBA in charges drawn. So he's, he's always going to compete. He's going to put his body out there on the line and, and do his best, but defense isn't his strongest suit. However, it's team USA and not the Knicks. And so with this roster being so deep and so balanced, Steve Kerr has the luxury to go with the Tyrese Halliburton, go with an Austin Reeves. Uh, offensively, those guys are going to change the pace. They're going to play a lot faster. Defensively, they're going to get after it. And then you're also going to get some playmaking with those guys as well. At the same time, you can play Brunson and Halliburton in the backcourt together or Brunson and Reeves, you know, those guys have shared the backcourt as well. So Steve Kerr has a lot of options where if Brunson is impacting the team a bit negatively on the defensive side, he can switch it up. You can go to Halliburton, you can go to Reeves, get that spark and in interchange those guys as the game dictates. So I don't necessarily see it as, as a major issue. And if he's not playing that many minutes, I, I don't think Knicks fans are going to mind that either. Right. Right. But size for this Team USA squad on a whole could be an issue because they do tend to play small with Jaron Jackson Jr. at the five. And while he's an elite defender and elite shot blocker, uh, rebounding, he's, he's not a top quality rebounder in the NBA. I believe he only averaged about 6.8 boards. And so... When Team USA plays these bigger teams like Germany, they may see Lithuania with Jonas Valanciunas manning the, manning the paint. He's a rebounding machine. They're going to get tested there. And so it's not – I don't think it's it's necessarily Brunson only with the size it's advantage. I think it could impact Team USA's front court when they play these bigger teams with, with, uh, with true NBA centers. Exactly right. It seems like every game they played, even in the exhibition phase, they struggled with size, struggled with rebounding. Uh, Germany was a prime example. I mean, they got uh, killed on the boards. I think they were minus 10, minus 12 on the boards. Yeah. Second chance points, same thing, huge deficit. So, yeah, I mean, exactly. It's not just Brunson. We can't single them out here. Uh, it's a team-wide problem, and they're going to have to rebound by committee uh, to get down and dirty. And uh, one player that's not going to be shy at all when it comes to getting boards in the backcourt is uh, uh, Josh Hart. Uh, another fellow Nick uh, had a great season for New York and he brought that another element of just uh, gritty play, tough play, playing bigger than he is six, four, but plays like he's six, eight, uh, just really tough, taking charges, getting steals. And for a lot of the same reasons that they brought Brunson on board, they went ahead and did the same for Josh Hart. The two know each other. So you, you spoke earlier about a little bit of a lack of experience, lack of continuity chemistry with this team. 
that helps alleviate some of that a little bit. You got two guys that have played with each other before. Uh, they know each other very well, so they can come into them, this uh, stage uh, internationally and not have as much of a learning curve when it comes to playing with each other. So Hart definitely helps a lot in that way, and I'm glad he's a part of this team for those reasons. So that helps a little bit more uh, when it comes to his contributions. And uh, going back to the New York situation here a little bit, wanted to touch on this. We can't ignore the fact that uh, he's got a little bit more money in his pocket as of uh, this summer. Uh, four years, $81 million extension reported not too long ago. So really happy for Hart. He deserves every penny. He plays hard. Uh, he brings a lot to this New York team. They're happy to have him. And again, he just fits like a glove with that typical culture. Yeah. Uh, just what, what he brings to the table. So, uh, you know, we asked you about Brunson last year. Want to get your thoughts about Hart this year. How do you feel about the deal, uh, the dollar amount, the years? And, uh, you know, him being a part of this New York culture here long term. Well, I loved it when they picked him up at the trade deadline. I mean, the, the best rebounding guard in the NBA or, or if not number one, number two, uh, a two way force, a Tom Thibodeau player, as you said, you, you know, Brunson set that tone. Randall kind of ke kept them on that in incline and then Hart really just took him over the top to, to ensure that they solidified that fifth seed and making that playoff run. He was very instrumental uh, when he got to the Knicks at that trade deadline. And when I saw the deal, number one, I knew he was going to get close to that amount of money when he opted in to that $12.9 million player option and which allowed the Knicks to sign Dante DiVincenzo to close to the mid-level exception. I knew the Knicks were going to reward Josh Hart with a deal that was going to be close to $20 million per year. Now with the salary cap increasing and with you have inflation, you know, $20 million a year is not the same as it was five years ago. So the immediate overreaction that a lot of fans have, not just with Josh Hart, but with a lot of NBA free agents is overpay, overpay, overpay. But when you really dig into the numbers and look at, how much that salary is going to count against the salary cap percentage wise, the highest it's ever going to get is 13.7% of your cap. Mm -hmm. And so as they go into the year and on top of that, the only three years are guaranteed the fourth year is a team option, which oh, Leon true. Rose, which, which Leon Rose and his crew have done a great job in doing when they brought these guys here. A lot of these guys have been here on three plus ones, two plus ones, one plus ones. Mm -hmm. So they did yeah. another great job there. And then when you look at the value, what he brings to this team, Josh Hart is another guy that covers a lot of mistakes for this team. When you think about his rebounding, getting this team out in transition, sometimes he can be a one-man fast break. His selflessness, his ability to play make, making smart reads, another high IQ player that this team desperately needs. He, he's a very valuable component to this Knicks team. And so I was happy with the deal. I felt like it was, it was a foregone conclusion that he was going to stay with the Knicks and now, what does he need to improve? You hope that he can find some consistency in his outside shooting. Mm -hmm. Because when he got to the Knicks, he, he hit a huge, huge hot streak. And then it, it kind of came, then he came back to the mean, which you would expect. But then in the playoffs, he became a non-factor. And once he became a non-factor, it really compromised the Knicks spacing. It clogged up the paint a lot more. Tom Thibodeau made some really wonky rotation changes with between Hart and, and Quinton Grimes and things kind of grind, grinded to, the, to a halt, especially in that heat series. So his yeah. outside shooting is definitely something that I love to see him improve on. Yeah. I was thinking the same thing. As soon as you said improvement, my mind went to the shot. Uh, all you have to do is go back to the Miami series. And uh, for them, it was trying to slow down Jalen Brunson. And how did they do that? They started loading up on him and, gave Josh Hart a little bit more space, which, as you mentioned, compromised their offense. So definitely an area that we need to watch. Although he's not actually exactly a bad shooter. I mean, like you said, it was ebbs and flows. So it's not like he's just straight up a, a non-factor out there. Um, shot about 37% for last season. And first career, he's at about 35. So he's about a league average shooter when you look at the numbers. Not too bad for a guy like Josh Hart that brings you the, uh, brings you the defense, brings you the rebounding, and he's just a really good glue guy, a good connector that does a lot of great things on the court. So I'm with you. The contract is solid. Uh, 20 million annual average value in this economy, uh, so to speak, is not bad at all. And uh, you pointed out the percentage of the cap. We talked about 13%. Not exactly uh, crazy. I mean, it's not 20. It's not 30. He's not being paid like a max player by any stretch. 
He's being played like a very solid upper level role player, which he is. It's exactly what he is. So when you look at it from those different perspectives, it starts to make a lot more sense. And for New York specifically, their you know their cap situation. You know, I always love to go back to their these teams' numbers. It's kind of like one of the things we do and specialize here over at uh, NTC. It's really interesting to see that they do um, still have some space under the apron. I mean, when you talk about their tax base, they're not in huge trouble as far as like their different avenues for signing players being stripped away. Um, you know, Randall's is, is under contract, DiVincenzo, Hart, Brunson, Barrett. So they're in a good place financially with all their major players locked up. So that's definitely a plus for them. And um, I like that you brought up the, the team option uh, for them uh, with this contract because, you know, like you said, I remember, I think it was like two years ago, you know, when you had, uh, I think it was like Taj Gibson and yeah. uh, you know, Bobby Portis and all these guys. I think they all had uh, Fournier when he was signed, all team options. Mm -hmm. uh, for that last year. So definitely some smart maneuvering uh, when it comes to the front office, uh, having an option on the tail end of it, if an opportunity to sign somebody else comes up and need to shed some space, Hey, we don't have to bring this guy back. It's a team option. We can move on. So I think that's another smart maneuver when it comes to trying to navigate the cap here for New York. Uh, now one more player um, that is currently with New York and uh, he's looked pretty good here in the off season. Uh, we talk about him all the time. He's, he's, He's coming up on this extension for himself that pays him 23 to $29 million over the next four years, RJ Barrett. And uh, I saw a tweet here a little bit earlier. Uh, it was something along the lines of when RJ was playing great in the exhibition, nobody said anything. And then he has one bad shooting game this morning at the international stage, you know, they're playing against uh, France and uh, you know, uh, Canada won big by 30 and everybody loses their minds because he shot yeah. one for 10 and, you know, had five points and, people want to harp on him so i mean do you feel like that does he get some unfair treatment when it comes to people criticizing his game uh you know how do you feel about him going into this contest here internationally you know what are your, some of your overarching thoughts here uh currently when it comes to rj rj's inconsistency is what creates that polarizing dynamic and that debate amongst fans because in one exhibition, you'll see him drop 30. And you're like, wow, this is what he can he can become. We've seen mm -hmm. this at, in spurts in the regular season with the Knicks over the course of his four years. Wow. You know, and, and you see that. And so you believe in it because that fan is saying he's only 22. He's growing. He's improving. Let him cook and let him get through his lumps. And then on a day where they're playing France and he goes one for 10 from the field, the naysayers say, I told you he's not the guy. He has no bag. He's this, he's that. He's a number three pick. He's going into year five. When is he going to put it all together? That's the conundrum with RJ Barrett is that he's yet to find a consistent play in his game. So it's, uh, it, it's confusing, man. You know, it, yeah. again, case in point, regular season, he had some brutal stretches on both ends. Defensively, yeah. he was very porous offensively highly inefficient still not able to finish at the rim not able to to uh, knock it down from three but in the playoffs he seemed to find it he seemed to find it he found some consistency I would say from the middle of game two of the Cavs series up until about that that elimination game against the Miami Heat he, he had been pretty good on both sides of the ball and he had also been passing well but for RJ Barrett if he's not going to be an efficient shooter or find somewhere in the mid range that he can rely on, he's going to have tough nights because one of the things that he attributed his exhibition success in the FIBA game to was the fact that the paint was wide open. Well, with the Knicks, he's not going to have that. And Mitchell Robinson right. not going to space the floor for you. Julius Randle might not space the floor as much for you. So there's going to be many a nights where he's trying to get points in a crowded field. And sometimes with R.J. Barrett, when he doesn't have an intermediate go-to move, it can seem a bit forced. It can seem very clunky. So that's sure. where he, he's got to really work on his game because that spacing is just not going to be there for him this year for the Knicks. So he's in a tough spot. He is, man. It, it's, it really is. And you think about the roster construction, I feel like if, it's, if he was in a different place, it might be a little bit better for him. It'd be more optimal. He'd be able to showcase his talents a little bit better than if he was in New York. So, I mean, got to cut him a little bit of slack. 
But at the same time, you do want to see him become more consistent. He has the talent. You know, he was drafted very high. So you want to see him just continue to step his game up every season. And one player that came to mind for me when we're talking about the inconsistency of R.J. Barrett is Jamal Murray. Uh, if we think back to his early days, so he was in years two, three, four, before the bubble, I feel like a lot of people had the same perception of Jamal Murray because he would get these stretches where he's just unstoppable. He would take over, he would hit four or five threes, break people down, cross people over, break ankles, and then he would kind of go quite a little bit. I feel like it was at about this juncture of uh, his career, it was about, I, I think, year four or five when he got to the bubble, that it started all come together and now he's an NBA champion. Not necessarily saying the same is going to happen for RJ. All I want to highlight is that he's in a stretch of his career to where he can still put it all together. It can still work out for him. It's not like he's doomed. We need to start writing him off because he's entering year five. There's still some growth to be had here. There's still another step that he can achieve. And I'll, I'll touch on this a little bit when we get to the um, division previews here. But I think RJ kind of sets the tone for the rest of the team as far as their ceiling. If RJ remains at this level the rest of the way, I think it's going to be more of like a second round, maybe a conference yeah. finals of New York. But I keep thinking, I'm like, if we get that RJ that we saw in the first few games of the exhibitions for the World Cup for Canada, the sky's the limit. I mean, imagine RJ that's averaging 25 points a game uh, with 37, 38% from three as opposed to the 31 he shot last season, 34 for his career. Uh, steps up the free throw game a little bit. I mean, he's only a 70% free throw shooter for his career. We talk about the three ball. Or we have to talk about the free throws. He's got to get better when it comes to converting easy opportunities. He's going to get fouled a lot. He attacks rim a lot. I mean, you guys know this in the New York side. He has to convert those easy opportunities. But if he does, Canada can win the gold. New York can win the championship. I mean, I think it's that simple when it comes to RJ. The team kind of goes as far as RJ can take them in that regard. I agree 100%, especially when you look at this Knicks roster. Uh, Brunson and Randall are going to do what they can, but it's really R.J. Barrett who's the guy that can really change their fortunes if he can, again, find that consistency. He finished the, the season averaging 19 points per game. If he's able to knock down a couple more free throws, get a couple more bunnies at the rim to go in, a couple more from the outside, you're talking about 24, 25 points per game. Now he's in a whole other like, different conversation. And so mm -hmm. that's just a frustrating thing, man, because he's going to have a lot of opportunities with Jalen Brunson and Julius Randle commanding the usage on that team. Off ball, he's going to have to deliver. And when he is on ball, one of the things you heard in, in the telecast when, when Canada just beat France by 30 points in, in their first group play matchup is something that Tom Thibodeau had been preaching. The announcer, when he saw R.J. Barrett taking some shots was saying twice on the telecast said he's forcing he's forcing way too much and you don't need it you had hot hands on Canada who who should have gotten the ball or you just take what the defense gives you and don't try to bite off more than you can chew just for the sake of pulling yourself out of a rut because that's when right. bad things happen and RJ gets into those modes a lot and Tom Thibodeau said the same thing when R.J. Barrett had great games for the Knicks in the past, he said, look, he just has to take what the defense has given him and don't try to do too much. Yeah, I, I just found that to be very interesting. Me too, and I think it's spot on. R.J. just has to find a balance between being aggressive and uh, laying off the gas a little bit because he's, he's not playing for a team that desperately needs him to be a 30-point guy every night. There's a guy named Shea Gilders Alexander on that team. You may have heard of him. He, right he's, he's pretty nasty uh, by all accounts. So he doesn't need to to force the issue, you know, like these guys are talking about. He just needs to find his place. You know, he can be a cutter. He can be more of an off-ball guy. Uh, I don't think the spacey concerns are as bad as, you know, as it is when he's playing with the Knicks. So I think it affords him an opportunity to kind of look at other parts of his game that are off-ball, that are not necessarily throwing up a bunch of three-pointers or, you know, just trying to find spaces where, you know, you're forcing things. Just – try to improve on those little bits of your game. And I, I love that he's a part of this international competition because it seems like so many players that are on the cusp of something great, they find that springboard in FIBA in the Olympics and they just carry it with them that next campaign. I, I think it's, this is going to do a lot of the same things for RJ Barrett. So I'm excited to see where he goes from here. Now a player for New York, that's not playing an international competition, but I think he's probably the most fascinating player 
on New York when it comes to his near term future is Emmanuel quickly. Yeah. Uh, I, I feel like CP, we couldn't have a conversation about New York and not talk about quickly because by all accounts, he was, he was great last season. He was fantastic. I mentioned on my Twitter a few days ago, I think he's becoming one of the more underrated players in our league just because, you know, you talk about his quickness, uh, no pun intended. Uh, you know, you talk about his ability to get to the rim and to have a handle on everything, but you got to think about his ability to be a defender as well. And I think that part of his game is overlooked. Um, I think it adds another layer of value for him. And it brings up an interesting question when it comes to his upcoming restricted free agency in 2024. Uh, he's on a bargain contract right now at $4 million. That's going to change here uh, very soon for him, for the team. So, you know, when you think about this last campaign, it went really well for him. He's a great three-point shooter. He can pull it from deep, which is going to offer a lot of spacing to a team. We just talked about they need that in a big way. So want to bring up a few questions to you when it comes to his game. Uh, you know, how do you feel that last campaign campaign went for quickly? Uh, where do you kind of see his game going forward next? Where does he need to improve? I mean, what, what are you expecting from quickly and what do you expect the Knicks to do with quickly? Is he traded? Do they keep him on restricted free agency next year? I mean, wh where do you see his career going next? Quick was incredible last year. His story when you, in, in addition to Jalen Brunson's and, and Julius Randle's all-star level campaigns and the Knicks playoff run and Josh Hart quickly emerging as one of the best role players in the NBA was, was a tremendous story. He was Mr. Everything for the Knicks. Going into last year, he was already one of the most trusted players on that team by Tom Thibodeau. He had led the Knicks in fourth quarter minutes. He was a, he was a crunch time player for the Knicks. And then last season, he just took his game up another level from the three point shot, tremendous improvements in the mid range between the floater be becoming more effective and more uh, mid range shots that he was taking. And then his defense was impeccable. His off ball defense. A lot of his teammates likened him to being the quarterback of that defense. And you read a lot of, of the beat writers articles on him. And he talked about so much of him being a film rat and a gym rat and really just being that communicator, barking out the signals, anticipating plays before they happen. Uh, that was quickly for the Knicks, man. And he was super versatile, not just as a reserve man, and maybe this hurt him when, when it came to losing to Brogdon, but as a starter, he, he averaged 22 five and five on like a 60% yeah. true shooting percentage. He was in, in, insane. And these are insane numbers. And overall, it seemed like his true shooting percentage as the months went by into last season improved and improved and improved. Now, from an improvement standpoint, the free throw percentages were, were, were kind of had their peaks and valleys. And from a guy like it quickly, you want to see that a little bit more consistent. And then sure. the biggest one for me is postseason play. It's really postseason play. It's nothing more, nothing less, uh, because in the postseason, he was woeful. Uh, he was very ineffective. It seemed like guys were beating, beating him to his spots. He didn't have that, that quick step. He didn't have that, that, that lightning rod energy that he would bring to this team during the regular season, and his minutes took a hit as a result. So he seemed to be kind of out of sync and lost in the series against the Cavaliers in the Miami Heat. Then he ultimately suffered that that ankle injury. But for quick, that that's what I'd like to see next season is if this team gets back into the playoffs and maintains their level of competitiveness as from where they left off. I want to see quickly really be that guy off the bench again for, for the Knicks and see what adjustments he makes to get back to regular season form or close to it. For sure, man. I mean, quickly has so much potential here. I mean, we're talking about a guy that's still in his early 20s. I mean, this guy is 24 years old, uh, just turned 24 this summer. So he still has another gear to reach in his game. And it, it, there's something about guys just coming out of certain college programs, man. I don't know what it is about Villanova, uh, about Kentucky, but, you know, you get guys from these programs, they just come into the league and they find a way to contribute at a high level. And, you know, you mentioned the playoff struggles. I mean, that's, that's as high as it gets as far as the tiers in the NBA. And he saw some growth on that end, but, when it comes to players with that amount of experience, he hasn't exactly been on that stage a lot of times in his career. You can overlook it. Uh, you know, he wasn't a starter for them. He wasn't a guy that's playing 30 minutes a game. So they weren't leaning on him to be a complete game changer. 
Uh, but I think the experience for him was really solid. I think it's going to serve him well moving forward in his career. And uh, I, I, I'm a huge fan. I love what he brings to the table at his size. Again, plays bigger than he is. I mean, when he's going to the rim, you would think it's a uh, six, five, six, six guy going to the rim, the way he can finish, the way he's unafraid, uh, just plays a lot of aggression, just like Brunson, just like Barrett, not afraid to kind of carve things up in the middle. Now, here's where it starts to get a little bit tricky is when you're looking at his contract situation. So he's reaching the end of his rookie contract. Uh, New York does have the right of first refusal next summer when it comes to restricted free agency. But for, I mean, you mentioned this uh, in our last segment, the guard rotation is cluttered. DiVincenzo, new contract. Brunson, new contract. Hart, new contract. Is there room for quickly to really become the best version of himself alongside those other players? They're all going to get a lot of minutes. Tibbs trust those guys a lot. They're being paid a lot of money. So I just wonder, are they going to look for opportunities to move on from quickly uh, to fortify the four rotation? Uh, do they stick with him the whole season? If they do, what kind of offers does he get? Do they keep him on? Do they match a big offer? Cause I don't know if it makes sense as far as the allocation of funds. If he gets a 20 plus million dollar offer from another team to bring him in, if he's going to be a backup guard. So, yeah. I mean, what, how do you see that kind of playing out when it comes to his upcoming free agency situation? That's going to be one of the biggest storylines of the 23-24 campaign is how the Knicks move forward with Emmanuel quickly. I mean, last offseason, last uh, trade deadline, we heard that he they were listening to offers for Emmanuel quickly, hoping to obtain a first-round pick. How legitimate that was, we will never know. But what's interesting is them bringing in Dante DiVincenzo, I believe – that gave them more flexibility in terms of if they need to make a move in the future, if Joel Embiid becomes available, if it's Donovan Mitchell, you name it, those guys that they're after, the big fish, DiVincenzo's pickup makes guys like it quickly, unfortunately, expendable. Now, when you think about playing time and his role, there were rumblings last year that his camp was unhappy with him being in that six man position, they were looking for opportunities for quickly to start even two seasons ago when the Knicks really had no answer at the point guard position when the Kemba Walker experiment failed. So there were rumblings coming from his camp about his playing time and his, his role with the team. Does he want to be a starter? Does he want to be a reserve? Well, that just got a whole lot more complicated with the addition of Dante DiVincenzo. And Thank so, God how Tom Thibodeau manages that rotation. Because remember, as I said, quickly has been Mr. Fourth Quarter for them. He has oh, yeah. been the closer for them. But with DiVincenzo here now, and we'll see what happens with Quentin Grimes. We'll see what happens with RJ with Hart. The Quentin two Grimes. and the three. You know, the, two, man. at Grimes, right? <laughs> so it, it, when, it, when it comes to the closing lineups in these games, the only position you're guaranteed is the one in the four. Jalen Brunson, yep. Julius Randle. The two and the three, and, you know, we, we, the five is a five, but the two and the three, we'll see who, who finishes there. And so the, the point is, is that Quickly's minutes could be impacted here, where now if he's going out and shopping his services as a restricted free agent, how many teams are going to say, well, this is our starting point guard, or this is a starting caliber point guard, let's pay him as such. I think he his, his market value – in terms of how much salary he can command might be capped because he will be, unless there's a catastrophic injury to Jalen Brunson, he will be relegated to a, a bench role. So I think that's going to be fascinating to see in terms of dollar amount. I think he's going to get 20, r r about 20, maybe 21. I don't mm -hmm. see him getting in mid twenties. I think that's when you're getting into starter level money, but what Josh Hart got, I think quickly will get a little bit more than that. So about 20, Yes, it'll be with the Knicks, I believe, but down the road, I think quickly could get traded in a blockbuster trade. It, it won't be at a trade deadline or, or for nominal gains. I think if the Knicks do trade Emmanuel quickly, it'll be in, in a blockbuster move, and, and that's what I see coming down the road. That would seem to make sense from the Knicks' perspective as far as managing their assets. It always helps to have too much instead of too little. So they're building that depth. They're giving themselves assets. It's always better to have guys in a contract. Like you said, you can swing a deal. You can uh, have a lot of money to match uh, if you're going after a big fish. 
Joel Embiid, the rumors are swirling. Who knows what's going to happen with the Sixers over the next two years? They can be a completely different team by the time we get to next offseason or the season after that. Who's to know? So I'm with you on that. It seems like a good idea from the Knicks perspective um, to hang on to him, uh, re-sign him, uh, match match whatever offers may come his way. Maybe they won't get any offers. Uh, we don't see a lot of restricted free agency offers during the offseason. I'd say maybe one or two will fly. Um, so that's probably what we should expect when it comes to his situation. But I mean, yeah, I, I do think it's the biggest, one of the biggest stories for New York and uh, something that I think we're all going to be watching very closely because he is one of our great up and coming guards in the game. Mm-hmm. And uh, he brings a lot to the team and a lot to the league. So really excited to see how that plays out. Um, CPS, we transition into the final segment of this podcast. Talking about New York. We're talking about all these guys who play for the Knicks. Can't talk about the Knicks without talking about the competition, man. I mean, yeah. We've got four other teams in the Atlantic that are going to give them some stiff competition. And I mean, you know, there's a lot of people out there. We talked about the Knicks here a little bit, so, you know, we can kind of tie them in as we go along in this kind of rapid fire segment. But the next team I, I wanted to kind of highlight here is uh, Toronto. So I would say I would, I would, I'm pretty confident when it comes to the Raptors finishing fifth in this division, finishing last. Yeah. You lose a guy like Van Vliet, you don't bring in any real support other than Schroeder. Schroeder's a great player. I mean, in the World Cup, he looks like Curry. It's that time. Yeah, it's yeah, kind of yeah. crazy. Yeah. <laughs> he just got his steps up to another level. Uh, but when it comes to an NBA, man, I mean, he's, he's a serviceable starting guard. He's solid. Van Vliet to, to Schroeder and not a lot of else other than Grady Dick in the draft. I, I don't see them beating up Brooklyn, New York, Philly, Boston in terms of the standings here. So, that's where I'm kind of at on the Raptors. I think they're going to be a diminished team. They're going to finish outside the play-in. However, there's still some things to watch with them. Siakam's trade situation. Got to keep tabs on that. Are they going to completely tear it down? Uh, what's up with Scotty Barnes? Uh, how does he kind of continue to mold at his game and, and grow as a player? Uh, really excited to see what, what comes from him. And then, uh, just exactly like what they're trying to do. Like, which direction do they want to go? Are they still trying to compete? Are they going in a different direction? Are they going to kind of tear things down and kind of start fresh? So that's what I'm kind of looking forward to seeing from Toronto. But, I mean, they're going to play hard. They're going to be competitive. They're not going to lay down. Unfortunately, I just think they already had shooting problems last season. Their offense stalled at times. Kind of some of the same weaknesses we saw from New York in the playoffs is what we see from from Toronto. So I think there's kind of a parallel there. They just don't have the quality of players that New York has when it comes to those big time guys that can step up and help them get to a big playoff spot. But how are you feeling about uh, Toronto hanging into next season? Well, you, you forgot to mention that they've got a lawsuit hanging over their heads, man, as a result well, of too. spying on the New York Knicks, spying on a world class organization, man. So yep. I, I thought that whole situation was uh, was very interesting to see unfold. How does that impact their new coach, Darko Rajakovic, who just mm-hmm. got on the job? Does that yeah. impact the, Does the NBA find them a draft pick? How does that impact their future? So uh, I think that's left to be seen. But with the Raptors, it's just very puzzling in terms of what direction they're going to go in. They lost Van Fleet. They brought back Pirtle. Yes, they drafted drafted Grady Dick. But the Siakam thing is very confusing. I mean, Ujiri has gone on record saying he's not a playing tournament guy. It's either you're in it or you're you're, you're rebuilding properly. And so for me – if they're going to go in there and invest money in, in Pascal Siakam, well, then you might as well invest in OG Ananobi too when he becomes a free agent in two years, right? right. You might as well keep those two guys. And, and then Scotty Barnes, when, when it's his turn in, in probably, I, I think, two or three more years. So mm-hmm. it's going to be very interesting to see. But right now, it just seems like a team without a direction. Schroeder's okay oh, yeah. at the NBA level. They uh, um, Gary Trent Jr. opted into his deal. But it just seems like they're they're all over the place, man. And so they've got to pick a direction. But for right now, I'm with you. I, I think they finished last in the division. Yeah, I mean, you brought up uh, something that I think it's probably the most confusing move they've made over the past 12 months. The Pirtle trade, you know, grabbing him from San Antonio. On the paper, it's like, oh, that's great. You're bringing in a plus rim protector, a plus rebounder. You can have some really big games for you, uh, you know, as far as the starting center. But you give up. Uh, some draft assets to grab him. 
And, uh, you know, your mission looks like to compete and to be in the playoffs, which they, um, you know, it didn't really work out for them the way they um, the way they thought. They lost the playing game to Chicago, I believe. And uh, you re-signed Hurdle, but it's like you look at your roster and I'm like, I don't really see you being that competitive when it comes to the Eastern Conference, which is improved. The Bostons are out there, the Phillies, the Miamis, the New Yorks, the Brooklyns. So much uh, Indiana looks improved. I mean, there's just yeah. so much competition out there. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm with you. I don't really understand kind of what they're trying to do. I think for them, they're just going to ride this thing out, get to the end of the season. If they're not competitive, maybe do a little bit of a subtle, maybe not use the word tank. That that word is kind of taboo these days. But, um, you know, just kind of take their foot off the gas a little bit and maybe they end up with another top 10 pick and next year's draft and kind of go from there. So, yeah, who knows, man? I mean, the, the North has some issues to work out. And, of course, that lawsuit is a big one. We're going to have to see how that plays out because that's not something you see every day yeah. as far as <laughs> accusations and, and, and lawsuits and things like that. That's pretty right. interesting. So moving on, man, another team here in the uh, in this division that's uh, probably the favorite to be at the top of the class once again. we got to talk about Boston here a little bit. Um, a few of our podcasts this offseason have been about Jalen Brown's new contract. We've covered that. Uh, we've, we've covered the fact that, you know, they're working without Marcus Smart. We've dug into that as well. Got to highlight those two things here real quick. Uh, overall, you know, bringing in Porzingis, you know, a, a pretty solid trade on paper. They have a ton of bigs. They have some insurance on that front. Tatum is still Tatum. Brown is still Brown. Uh, they have a lot of great things going for them. So they're going to be at the top of the class. The question is, can they get over the hump? That's the big thing for them. They they have to find a way to kind of break back into the finals to kind of right the wrongs of last offseason where they, I mean, yeah, it was a seven game series, but. I, I, you know, you look at it and it's like they almost got swept. So, I mean, they had a lot of issues in the, in the postseason last year. The wing rotation, how does the wing rotation look like behind Brown, behind Tatum? How do they cope with losing Smart? There are a few questions in that camp. I don't think it's as cut and dry as, oh, they're going to be back in the finals or conference finals. I mean, there's going to be a lot of competition there. So quick thoughts on Boston uh, in, in as far as moving on to next season and the aftermath of uh, – Pretty tough loss there in the conference finals. Yeah, brutal loss for the Celtics, man, in that conference finals. Just uh, so confusing after, after you know, getting past Philadelphia, just really just laying an egg against the Miami Heat. But right now, what they showed you was after trading Marcus Smart, which I felt like, you know, a lot of teams had to make those cap casualty type of moves as they look to build towards the future. And they're being mindful of that second apron. So they had to jettison their emotional leader, their defensive leader. And now that puts the pressure and the onus on Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. This is your team. They're going to go as far as you take them. And, and if I was a Celtics fan and I'm looking at this team, they're in a good spot to have two of these players, two of the premier wings in the NBA in their prime, who has taken this team to an NBA finals, a number of, of uh, Eastern conference playoff appearances, Eastern conference finals, uh, there's a lot of fans of teams that would kill for that. So, so they're in a great spot. Now it, it's about the supporting cast and how far they can, how much they can make that team better. That to me is the key between Tatum and Brown. You know, Missoula is, he, he's going to be, have his work cut out for him in his first full season with the team. He's going to be able to mold his staff the way that he envisions it. I'm sure they're still going to be, a, a high three-point shooting, high octane offense, especially when you bring Porzingis in there. Uh, Porzingis is going to help with the playmaking as well, and, and as well as his floor spacing. And then you have flexibility. If you want to go two bigs with Porzingis and Robert Williams, do you want to go small? You still have Horford there. So you have some flexibility there on the offensive defensive end with the addition of Porzingis. But then now he's out three to five weeks with plantar fasciitis. The Here durability do question with Kristaps Porzingis is going to be there. The durability with Robert Williams, durability with Malcolm Brogdon, your sixth man of the year, who mm-hmm. couldn't yeah. get you over the hump against Miami because he had the torn forearm uh, muscle. So that, I think, is going to be a problem because I still think the Celtics' depth is a little bit questionable because after, exactly. after Brogdon on that bench, you know, Jordan Walsh had a, had, a, had, a, had a good summer league, but – 
What's he going to look like once he steps up to the big leagues? You know, summer leagues is is not regular season. Right. You got guys like Sam Hauser. Um, you, you know, we'll see what, like what a, what a Pritchard does on that team. But there, I think their depth is still a little bit questionable. I, I think Boston's depth is still a little bit questionable. But as you said, you still have to give them the edge to finish first in, in the Atlantic. For sure. Yeah, that's what I was um, thinking about when I was looking at their depth chart here. I mean, a lot of solid players, but – once you get past the starting five, it's, you know, okay, we're looking at uh, probably Horford, uh, Pritchard, Cornette. I mean, they brought in, they have um, Brissett that was formerly with Indiana. They brought in Banton, who was with uh, Toronto, who we just Toronto. talked about. Yeah. Yeah. Jordan Walsh at 38, a uh, very solid player. So, I mean, those guys are going to be relied on heavily, especially if Brogdon goes down or – Porzingis goes down or Robert Williams goes down. I mean, all those guys, I mean, that's, that's pretty usual for them to miss at least 10, 15 games. Yeah. So when it comes down to that, I mean, they're going to have to rely on these other guys to step up in their, in their absence. And we're going to see how well they can do that. But as long as they have Tatum and Brown leading the charge and, and Derek white with what he brings to the table, there's a pretty high floor for them. I, I wouldn't see them finishing in lower than third in the conference just because their their top end talent was that good, and they have a very good foundation, so if I was a Celtics fan, I'd be expecting another great season. But I'd be a, a little bit concerned when it comes to their ability to get into the promised land. And I don't think they have unlimited time. I mean, Horford is getting older. Yeah. Uh, the cap casualties you just mentioned are going to get worse as time goes on. So I think they need to have a sense of urgency and and find a way to kind of get past that those those demons they've been facing in the conference finals and with the turnovers and and, and the stuff that haunts them every year. So the time is now as, as, as young as they are, the time is now, I believe for, for Boston. Yeah. And when you look at the investment in Brown, Tatum's going to get his bag soon. They just signed extended poor Zingas. It's going to be crucial for Brad Stevens to find lightning in a bottle deep into the draft because they're going to be picking outside of the lottery late in first round. So guys like a Jordan Walsh, that he's going to have to step up and deliver high value on a rookie scale deal because they're not going to have much wiggle room to go out there and get your know, prime time free agents and things of that nature. So yes, it's on white, it's on Brogdon to deliver, but also your younger guys, you're going to have to draft well and find some lightning in a bottle to help your depth. As you, as you, especially as you get deeper into into the season and into the playoffs, for sure, that's all very key. You got to have guys at every position, all the way down the line, one through eight, nine, ten, that can contribute hundred um, percent. So, um, as we wind this thing down, a couple more teams in the Atlantic that are going to be very competitive: uh, Philadelphia. We got the rumors, man. We got the rumors flying. We got the speculation. You know, James Harden, he's created a, a circus in Philadelphia right now. Who knows this, how that's going to work out? As of today, we still have no idea. But when it comes to how they can perform next season, let's assume Harden settles down and he he gets back into a rotation with them and things kind of smooth over. Still got Embiid. Still got P.J. Tucker. Yeah. D'Anthony Melton. Uh, very solid depth for them. They have the top and they have the reigning MVP. So by all accounts, this is another very dangerous team. Their regular season, no one's worried about the regular season. They're going to be uh, uh, an excellent regular season team and beats going to assert his will. Um, my big question with them is have they already blown their best opportunity to win a championship? I, I think last season was their best chance. When yeah. you look at what Harden did in the first couple of games against Boston in that series, when you look at how much Embiid was just dominating, he was determined to win MVP. They had the depth. They had guys coming off the bench. Max, he took another leap. He looked great. Everything was in place for them to to kind of get to the next level, and they still couldn't get it done. Um, Harden, um, you know, I, I just think he just doesn't have it in him, man, to just perform at a game seven, a game six, uh, carry the team over the hump, get them to the finals. I just have lost faith in their ability to do that. However, you know, they're still you still got to watch out for them in the earlier rounds. I mean, if New York goes up against them, that's still a stiff test. Yeah, um, they have a lot of great pieces. Uh, they have a lot going for them. Um, I believe Nick Nurse is in the fold now. Um, Doc Rivers is out. Yeah. So that could change some things for them. It could, um, you know, give a give us a little bit of a different side of things when it comes to how Philly plays. So thoughts on the Sixers with new coaching, uh, a lot of drama, and still a whole lot of talent. 
So much question marks, though, man. Like the Harden thing is is key because if if he intends to sit out, like he says that he is, and Maury being Maury, you look at what happened with the Simmons trade. Maury will be in no rush to move him. That impacts Philadelphia greatly, and and you're not even getting to how they play under Nick Nurse. How do they adjust under Nick Nurse? How does he handle that personnel? What adjustments does he make to their scheme to make them better? They've got a lot of question marks there, man. And so without Harden, I I just don't see Philadelphia being able to maintain their edge. You're right. I think last year was a great chance for them, especially against Boston when Boston wasn't looking so strong. You look at, you looked on the other side and, and Milwaukee was struggling with Miami with the Greek freak with injuries and Milwaukee didn't seem to be the same team. I also thought in, in the 2020, 21 season was that was one of their best years when they were number one in the East. And then they yep. flopped out to Trey Young and the Hawks. I thought that was another yeah, season where brutal. they should have been able to capitalize and make a finals run. So that window could be closing, man. And if, if Harden sabotages this thing, I don't see Philadelphia being able to, uh, to, to maintain in the East. Look, I love Tyrese Maxey. I love his game. I think he's a promising player. They're going to need him to really shine brightly and carry this team. But they're another team that, you know, Melton is good, a good three-point shooter, good defender as well. They still have Korkmaz off the bench, yeah. but they're another team. I, I don't really like their bench all that much. And w- without Harden, I think they're going to struggle. Me too. Me too. And Mead's going to miss some games. You know, he's going to be out for a little bit. They lo- They already lost uh, Montrez Harold injury with a torn um, MCL and meniscus, I believe, ACL and meniscus. So, I mean, just brutal blow already. Um, so their front line is going to be thin. B-ball Paul has got to step up and take the charge when it comes to that end of the yeah. floor. So, yeah, man, I'm with you. A lot of question marks. And um, unfortunately, I, I I think that their time has come and gone. They had prime opportunities, the talent, the coaching, depth, and uh, couldn't get it done. So, uh, But either way, they're still going to be a great team in the 23-24 season that you got to watch out for every night. One more team uh, that we got to keep tabs on that's going to be um, pretty interesting. They have a World Cup participant of their own uh, in Mikel Bridges. That's the Brooklyn Nets. And, uh, you know, the Nets, next door neighbors, got that uh, rivalry with New York. Uh, I believe they have a game on Rivals Week um, in the NBA calendar that, my, me, myself, I feel like it's a little bit of a gimmick. You got no, some teams course. playing against oh, each other. It's like, yeah. that's a yeah. rivalry? Really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, see the Spurs. I don't. I don't. I still don't understand that one. I, I'm totally confused. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, but I, I will. I would wager to say that I think New York, Brooklyn do have a legitimate rivalry. I mean, yeah. when you guys match up against each other every season. You're looking to take that matchup. It's it's bragging rights from across the borough. It's a big deal, man. And uh, you know, Brooklyn they they don't have the top end that I think some of these other teams have. I think they're kind of the inverse of of Boston. But man, do they have a lot of great players? I mean, Cam Johnson, Mikel Bridges, Dinwiddie, Claxton. Claxton yeah. is—I uh, think he's going to be in the mix for. I think an all-defensive team. The way he just locks people down and moves to the perimeter. So many great players, man. So when it comes to a team that's just fun to play because they play as a team, and uh, they will definitely be in the mix for another uh, playoff spot. And um, don't know how far they'll get in the playoffs, but you're going to have to watch out for them every single time down the floor, man. It's going to be Brooklyn. They have a lot going for them. They have a lot of assets. Uh, they have some draft capital that they're going to be getting uh, in the near future from some of these other teams, um, Houston, I believe. So when you think about what they're going to have coming to them uh, from Phoenix as well, uh, moving on from KD, I mean, they have a lot of potential. And uh, similar to you guys, um, New York has a lot of uh, assets to offer and a potential trade for a star. I think Brooklyn has the same ability. They have so many assets, so much matching salary that they can offer up. So a couple of questions I have about the Nets. Who's the next guy up after Bridges? Bridges is probably going to be the leading scorer once again. Who's the number two? Uh, What does the growth curve look like for Claxton? What's the ceiling? And uh, is there enough of a top-end talent for them to do any better than last season? I mean, I think they might be capped out at another – 45 to 47 win season uh, first round out. But how do you feel about them going forward? Yeah, man. I, I love to see what, what uh, the, the player that Mikhail Bridges is becoming. 
and he he really emerged out of that spotlight in Phoenix and showed that he can be much more than just a role player and and shot the ball with incredible efficiency showed a lot from a shot creation standpoint when he got to Brooklyn man Mikhail Bridges was super impressive with that team now we'll see as teams start to game plan for him a little bit more We'll see if that was just a hot season or he can really maintain that. But McCall Bridges was nothing short of outstanding for the Nets when he got there. I love Cam Johnson, love his game. He's really emerged uh, when when he left from Phoenix. But you know what? I'm going to go out on the limb here and say that for them to have a sta- an, an outstanding season, their second place player needs to be Ben Simmons. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I like it, man. It's I ben, like it. It's Ben Simmons, man. Now, am I going to bet money on it? Absolutely not. However, at his peak, an all-defensive player, a guy who at one time almost averaged almost close to seven assists a game, a a playmaker when he was at his peak, I think that's what the Nets could use in terms of just giving them a shot in the arm. I think Claxton's going to continue to take another step up. His development as uh, not just a defender but a finisher around the rim has been tremendous. We talked about Bridges. Johnson is a guy, but he he's not an initiator. He's a finisher. He's a finisher right. out there on the perimeter. You need an initiator. And Dinwiddie, still Dinwiddie, still a baller. He can yeah. still go out there and get you buckets. But if Ben Simmons ever can get close to his prime, his peak, three all-star games in a row, all-defensive player, a, a ferocious playmaker, I don't I don't I think I think it's asking for a lot, but I think if he can get there, it'll improve their chances in the East. But as you said, they still have pieces there and draft picks that they were able to recoup with the KD trade that they lost in the Harden trade. Are they a sleeper dark horse team to go get Damian Lillard? I think that's left to be seen. Where where is Sean Marks's thinking here? Is he trying to jump back into the into competing? Or is he really trying to build this thing slow and steady? I think that's going to be very interesting to see as their season plays out. Big time. Uh, I, I feel bad for leaving out Ben Simmons, a player of his caliber on this team. Uh, <laughs> rightfully, <laughs> rightfully so. Man. Yeah, man. I just, um, you know, but it, the, his highlights come up, I feel like, once a week. Uh, his highlights with Philadelphia, the things he was able to do for that team. In Summer Lee, he looked like the second coming of Magic Johnson. He, he was you. rolling down the court dunking on people, blowing by people, had some of the nicest dimes you will you will find in the NBA. Uh, so when it comes to his potential that's on the table, I mean, he's still in his mid-20s. If he's yeah. able to get right, man, that version of Ben Simmons on this team, it, it, it changes the whole equation. It completely morphs them from maybe a first round out, six to eighth seed to, wow, I mean, the borderline contender. I mean, that's what they need. Uh, but this is the place for Ben to – possibly reach anything close to that level because the expectations are low. Uh, I mean, me, myself, I've kind of somewhat written them off. I wouldn't say completely as far as being yeah. a, a good contributor, but I don't see him getting back to the level he was before. Even if he doesn't, if he come in and play 25, 28 minutes, uh, be a triple double threat, uh, kind of like a Draymond stat line, give me 13 points, 10 boards, 10 assists, something along those lines. Just I think the number one thing I'd want to see if I were a Nets fan, just be aggressive, just be confident. If you can get there, everything else will work itself out. Just use your size, your 6'10", use that court vision, that God-given court vision uh, that you have at your disposal, and just just work hard and just be tough, be a defender, do the little things, and that team will already be better than they were last season, so – that, those are things to look for, and I think in any case, it's going to be fun to kind of see them go back and forth uh, with New York, and uh, they have a lot going for them. They have a bright future, although they're still lacking a couple pieces to be a true contender. Yeah, I definitely agree on that one. So, CP, I think this about brings us to the uh, conclusion of this podcast, uh, but I do want to thank you again for taking the time to join us. Always a great experience having you on. Uh, your expertise when it comes to the Knicks and the things you do are are much appreciated and respected. So keep doing your thing. Uh, keep up the great work. And uh, before you head out, uh, real quick, just let the listeners know where they can find you and all your great content. Absolutely, man. Thanks again for having me. I definitely appreciate the time. You can catch us at youtube.com slash Knicks Fan TV. Uh, also, the NBA Report. You can follow us on all social media platforms at Knicks Fan TV or at 
Team NBA Report. So uh, also my handle, CP the Franchise, on Twitter and Instagram as well, man. So Aaron, great job as usual, man. Uh, shout out to the guys at the No Trade Clause, and thanks for having me on. Appreciate all that, man. Appreciate that all that for sure. Uh, no Trade Clause crew, if you're looking for more content, of course, check out our website. Cap sheet percentages are on there. If you want to see the percentage of the cap that Brunson, Josh Hart, all these guys are taking up of the cap quickly. Uh, it's a meager, very small percentage, but trust me, it's going to go up very soon. Uh, definitely take a look at our website for all those resources. And um, as usual, we will be coming back at you again in the coming weeks with more pods. Uh, once a week is our goal here. So definitely keep a lookout for that. But until then, everybody enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, enjoy this World Cup here as in the coming weeks. And uh, we'll see you on the next episode. Take care.